elected as UFO president is Monsieur Platini Michel. In January 2007, Michel Platini was elected president of UEFA. So one of the greatest players the world has ever seen is now one of its most powerful figures. And Platini still has a great feeling for the game. Football, well, it's pleasure, passion, joy, education, combat, and that's it. C'est ça. A simple vision from a man whose life in football has been nothing short of spectacular. This is a man whose life has been like a novel. Platini made the difference. He was extremely important because he ran the team. He's been the leader for French football, the boss. Michel could play with his eyes shut. I've never seen a player with such vision, a panoramic vision of the pitch. He had a mental influence, a psychological influence. He conducted the orchestra. He had an extraordinary life and succeeded in everything he did, as a footballer, as an organiser, and everything he's done has been his own choice. Michel Platini was born on the 21st of June 1955 in Jeuf, in the northeast of France. There was nothing too spectacular about this industrial corner of France, and the young Michel had a normal Catholic upbringing. Michel, though, did love football and was very well placed to soak up the region's passion for the game. Je suis. I was born into an Italian family with French nationality and the family ran a cafe, so I learned the culture of football very early because that was the centre of conversation for all the guys who worked in the factories and the mines in that corner of France. As a teenager, Michel Platini started to show remarkable talent. His father, Aldo, had been a professional player himself and helped his son realize his gift. But there was a bitter blow and Michel was sent home from a trial with the local club Metz, who thought he had a weak heart. But Metz's loss quickly became AS Nancy's gain as they moved fast to sign up a youngster of great promise. He was 16 years old when I met him and I remember playing for the regional team Lorraine against Belgium and he scored six goals in a 6-0 victory. He already had that quality. He didn't quite have the physique, but he had that genius. I saw him start, you know, uh, when he was 17 years old in Nancy, and uh, very quickly you could see that this guy was exceptional. He saw the game very quickly, and his great quality was that he could act on what he saw, and he was always the leader, the leader of our group. Of the 98 goals he scored for Nancy, the most important came at the Parc des Princes in the French Cup final against Nice. I got the goal around the 60th minute mark. It was a pass from Rio to myself, and I controlled it with my left foot and stuck it in the corner. It was Nancy's first trophy, and mine too. That was in 1978. It was the only time Nancy had won the French Cup in their history. He scored the goal and we won 1-0. It was with Nancy that Platini developed a devastating aspect of his game, the free kick, and it was Jean-Michel Moutier who had the task of keeping goal. We did it two or three times a week after training when the weather was good. And we had these free kick competitions. And the president saw us, so he brought us the first mannequins. And we would do that for half an hour, maybe an hour. We would play double or quits. It was just a game we played. Platini became one of the great masters of free kicks. Monsieur Couffon, as they called him in France. A deadly quality that stayed with him throughout his career. It 
It wasn't long before Michel was given the chance with the French team, and the 20-year-old, with his confidence and accuracy from set pieces, made an immediate impression. There was a free kick, and Henri Michel was there next to him, who always took the free kicks. And Michel said to him, move over, Henri, I'll take this one. He took the decision to take it, he shot it, and he scored. So I think the defining moment of Michel Platini's career was that moment when he came up to an experienced player, asked him to step aside, took the responsibility, took the shot and scored. They were innocent days for Michel at Nancy and perhaps the happiest of his career. There he met his wife Christelle and they were married in 1978. But the time came when Nancy star had to move on, and naturally, he was bought by France's top club, Saint-Étienne. At Nancy, the feeling was that we wanted to keep him. He was a footballing god who'd happened to play at Nancy. The history of the club comes down to him and what he did. It was a natural progression, because Saint-Étienne were the best club in France at that time. Michel was the best player in France, leaving for the biggest club in France. In his first season he did well, and there was a good team with Johnny Rep, a really good team. By the time Platini arrived at Saint-Étienne, Les Verts were a fading force in European football. Nevertheless, he managed to build on his achievements, scoring 58 times in 108 matches. We were champions in my last year, and we played in two French Cup finals, but we lost them both at Parc des Princes. But there were great memories, it was a great town, with fanatical support, and I had a great time there. The World Cup of 1982 was played in Spain. Platini had established himself as the French captain, and his side had good prospects as they moved fairly smoothly through two group phases, clinching a place in the semi-finals with a 4-1 win over Northern Ireland. Suddenly, France had a World Cup final in their sights, and their main chance of getting there would be via a talented midfield quartet led by Platini. For me, that midfield of 1982 was the best that France has ever seen, with Michel Platini, Alain Gires, Jean Tigana and Bernard Gengini. They called us the little Brazil, the Brazilians of Europe. We all kept it simple, we played the ball and worked together. Then the semi-final against West Germany, the match that Platini described as the most dramatic he'd ever played in. I remember that semi-final of 82, it was massive because we were put through every possible emotion. Fear and joy before actually playing in a semi-final. Disappointment when the Germans scored. Hoping to equalise. The will to win. That semi-final will always be remembered for a challenge by the German goalkeeper Harold Schumacher, which left Patrick Battiston with a broken jaw. Then the aggression towards Battiston, the bad feeling. That the referee didn't whistle when he should have, didn't send Schumacher off when he should have, and in the end we lost to a great injustice. It was very emotional to see Patrick go off like that, and we didn't know exactly what had happened to him. But it didn't hit us that much because we were so involved in the match. Extra time goals from Marius Trezor and Alain Gires put France in an apparently unassailable position. Then West Germany hit back through Karl Heinz Rummenigge and Klaus Fischer. Maxime Bossis missed a crucial penalty. And in the final act of an epic drama, Horst Trubesch put the Germans into the final. 
Afterwards in the dressing room, we found out that he had gone to hospital, but we didn't know what the injury was. And then there was the disappointment of defeat. In terms of a football match, I've never seen that kind of drama on the pitch, only in a film or in the theatre. It was a big moment. We lost, but it was still a big moment. It was a period of reflection for French football. They'd come so close in that semi, so could France ever dream of winning a final one day? There would be new stars to come into the team, like Luis Fernandez. 1982 was a good World Cup that finished very badly. But we felt that that generation began to reach maturity, started to reap the rewards of experience, and began to impose itself. We started to believe in ourselves. I think that from that moment on, we knew we were good, and that the French team that played against Germany could go on and do great things. The 1982 World Cup was eventually won by Italy through a crucial goal from Marco Tardelli, one of the many stars that Platini was about to link up with at the Italian champions Juventus. A lot of clubs were interested in me in 82, some English clubs like Arsenal and Tottenham, and I decided on Juventus because the calendar was easier and I didn't want to play matches at Christmas as they traditionally do in England. So there was a better schedule in a country where there was more sun too, and I chose Juve, which was always going to be an adventure because I really knew nothing about it. More than anything that Platini had experienced in France, football was everything to the Italians, and whenever the match day came along, Italy's cities and stadia reached fever pitch. It was obvious that Italy was going to be a further education for the French star. He had a different mentality to us, though. A more French way of thinking, where football was just entertainment. But in Italy, football isn't like that. Football is war. Football is religion, and he realized that. He threw himself into the game and helped us to win. Win a lot. It wasn't long before Platini was another of Juve's stars. He helped them to win the Italian Cup in 1983. Then in 84, they won the league title and the European Cup Winners' Cup. It had been a wise move for Platini. Italy was the best league without any contest in the world. It was a marriage of a country who suited well the way he sees the game, based winning mentality, efficiency, and uh, with an exceptional coach as well, Trapattoni. I think he finished uh, three years top scorer in the league as a number 10, that uh, at that time was quite exceptional because in Naples you had uh, Maradona, Careca, you had uh, the best players of the world in every single club. One of the many individual awards that Platini received will always stand out. Every year, through the offices of France football in Paris, journalists vote for the European Player of the Year, and they awarded him the Ballon d'Or. Michel Platini has the record in the history of the Ballon d'Or. He won three, but three consecutively. Other players like Marco van Basten have also won three, but not consecutively. So Michel Platini has the record. In his time at Juventus, Platini took his career to another level. But the most significant effect of the years in Italian football may have been felt back home in France. He was the only French player to play at Juve, and the Italian championship was always the benchmark. So now we had a French player in the Italian league, playing with the likes of Rossi, Tardelli, Cabrini, who were world champions in 82. And that's what gave us our leader. In 
We'd always played the beautiful game in France, all very nice, but we were purists. He brought in something that we didn't have before, which was this winning mentality. So France prepared to host the European Championships of 1984. They'd come close in 82, and the team had, if anything, improved. And this time, Platini was at his peak, in the most influential phase of his career. That tournament in 84 was so important to us because we were the organisers and we wanted to improve on 82 so much and we were the favourites. Also in 1984 we saw the emergence of one of the most celebrated midfield quartets of all time, Le Carré Magique or the Magic Square of Michel Platini, Jean Tigana, Alain Jures and Luis Fernandez. Magic because there was an understanding. Each one of us knew what we had to do. I couldn't play like Platini, and he couldn't play like me. Jerez couldn't play like me, nor could I play like him. But Platini needed Fernandez. Fernandez needed Tigana, Jerez, and Platini. And everyone knew that the Carré Magique was France's great strength. The Carré Magique were formidable but it was Platini who made the difference for France in 1984. He scored the winner in the opening fixture against Denmark. Then a hat-trick against Belgium. And perhaps the perfect hat-trick against Yugoslavia. A left foot finish. A header into the far corner. And a right foot free kick. One of those trademark Platini moments. It's like all the great teams. Maradona for Argentina. Cruyff for Holland. Every great generation has a great player who makes the difference. We saw an incredible Michel Platini. It was like he was playing on a cloud. He scored nine goals out of the 14 that France scored in that tournament. Incredible goals from free kicks from his head, left foot, right foot. At the semi-final stage, the going got tough for Platini's France. The disappointment of 1982 was a memory the whole nation needed to erase from their minds. And France against Portugal was no less dramatic than West Germany two years earlier. It was 2-2 and the match went into extra time. Then Michel Platini, who else, finished off the Portuguese and France were in the final. That was the key match, the most important, and the exact reverse of the semi-final against Germany and Seville. And because of what happened in Seville, France had the strength to win in Marseille. Because they had this strength, this will to win, this energy, they refused to be beaten, and everyone raised their game, including Michel Platini. So at last, Platini would lead France into a final. Was French football about to come of age? It was Platini himself who put the French ahead from a free kick, his ninth goal of the tournament. And when Bruno Ballon made it 2-0, it really was all over for the Spanish. And France were European champions, thanks to Michel Platini. He was at the peak of his art in a footballing sense in 84. He was at the very top. He was surrounded by good players, but it was down to him that we were the European champions. He dominated that competition like no other player has ever done. Perhaps an exception would be Maradona in the World Cup of 86. He also overshadowed everyone else with the performance of his era.
It was France's first trophy in a team sport. At last we had arrived and we could win. So now we knew that we could go out and win. And that was a great change for French football. So Platini went back to Juventus as a European champion with France. But there was one European trophy he had yet to win. We'd already lost two years earlier in the European Cup final, so it was important for the club and we really wanted to win. But May 1985, Juventus versus Liverpool wasn't the cup final that Europe was expecting. Violence broke out before the match and 39 people were killed. After UEFA took the decision to let the match go ahead, we didn't think of anything once it had kicked off. So you see, we were really happy that we'd won the match for the Italian supporters. Football is a game that's in my heart, but we took a big blow today. A year later saw Platini playing in the 1986 World Cup in Mexico. Once again though France lost to West Germany in the semi-final. Platini retired as a player but his influence on the game was in a sense just beginning. After 1986, French football went through a difficult period, with a lot of players leaving the French team. So the Federation had to call on a man like Monsieur Platini to rebuild the confidence of the team. I played for Michel in the European Championships of 1992, but it didn't go well. And I think at that point, he decided to leave in order to relaunch French football. Ever since his days as a youngster with AS Nancy, Michel Platini's great strength of character had driven him on to success. So with the playing days over, Platini was exactly the kind of character football needed in a position of authority. Platini was always the boss on the pitch. And then he asked himself what he would do after his career, and the answer was that he had to be the leader. He was the boss of the French team because he was the manager. Then he led the World Cup in 98 for the French Federation. And today he's the leader of European football because he's the president of UEFA. His life has been like a novel. He is the best French player of all time. He led us to victory and he gave us confidence after so many difficult years. He had an exceptional vision, the winning attitude, the winning mentality and as well a very, very efficient guy. And, uh, I think he still has that uh, in his mind when he speaks about the game today. Football is a game, it's completely irrational and that's why people love it so much. A game where you just never know who will win, the strongest, the weakest or the biggest. It's just an extraordinary sport.